of our lives with an encouraging hand. She has affirmed us when we needed affirmation. She has awakened us when we felt slumber and sleep in our eyes. And she has, with her breath of words, rekindled the smoldering embers of fires that we have had from time to time. She has fanned those flames of desire and commitment and excellence and prayer and dedication and commitment. And there's not anybody that I'd rather have walked to this pulpit this morning and addressed this conference than the pastor's wife of this great Pentecostals of Alexandria, faithful for so many years. Let's welcome Sister Vesta Lane Mangan to our pulpit today. the greatest ministers of all time sit in this room today, some on this platform, our great leaders, our sponsors, our many speakers, and the sooner we begin to believe all of this, the better off we're going to be. My husband of 46 years, he seeks no higher office than to be the senior pastor of the Pentecostals of Alexandria. Then my precious son, Anthony, whom I love and respect and call pastor, and he loves that. But on this day following the Day of Hearts, what could be a greater thing to tell you than God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, whosoever, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And it's either perish or everlasting life for every individual that has ever lived since God created Adam and Eve. And for that reason, though I speak with tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, agape, God love, I am become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. So this is not a sermon or a lecture or a message to fulfill a duty, an obligation or a responsibility. You will not hear or see a genuine example of the awesome subject. But you will hear and see a Christian rejoicing that God loves her. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If there is one truth more than another which I deeply wish we could somehow awake and make ourselves available to, and you would open up your minds and hearts to this truth, God loves you. The one and only deity, the infinite creator, who holds the winds in his fist and makes the clouds his chariots, who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and all the gold and silver are his whose almighty arms embrace the starry spaces and in whose hands our very breath is. He loves us all. He loves us without exception. God loves indiscriminately all races, creeds, and colors. And he loves each individual in distinction. That is the most profound, elevating, comforting news which was ever flashed from the throne of God and broke like a sunrise on planet Earth. God so loved. God so loved the world. God so loved the world that he gave. God so loved the world that he gave all. 
And when once that superlative wonder grips your mind and it is gratefully responded to, your whole life outlook will be dramatically transformed. For God, the universe, history, mankind, human life will all assume new meaning. It will put a new life in your mind. It will put a new song in your heart. It will put a new calm in your spirit. It will put a new restfulness amid adversity, a new confidence concerning the unfolding of the future. The love of God to all men everywhere is the high pinnacle of biblical revelation. Everything else has to climb up to it. Jesus Christ is the peak expression of it. The cross is the intense point of it. The gospel of whosoever will is the blood-bought salvation, is the magnanimous outflowing of it. Calvary's love, it's bigger than our biggest sinning. It forgives transgressions beyond counting. It gives release from the heaviest burden of guilt. Calvary's love sought us. Calvary's love bought us. It was there at that old green hill outside Jerusalem that we first heard the heartbeat of that infinite love. I don't know any better news to tell you today than God loves you. God so loves you. God so loves you, He gave all. And the idea of a God who gives all without condition and loves us all just the same and just as we are, that's incredible. Yes, it is, but it is true. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God, but God commendeth his love toward us. Even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I cannot tell you how long he has loved us. For we shall never know its beginning. I can trace it back 2,000 years ago and show you a stable, a manger, Gethsemane, a whipping post, and a cross. Oh, but he loved us before that. He loved you and me 6,000 years ago in creation when he formed us from the dust of the ground, breathed into our nostrils, and we became a living soul. Then he placed us in a beautiful home called the Garden of Eden, and he came to see about us every day. But it goes beyond that. For even before the foundation of the world, he was the lamb for sinners slain. And I don't know beyond that. How long? I really don't know. How much did he love me? Paul said to know the love of Christ, which passeth, which passeth knowledge. Sounds like a paradox. This means to be knowing. This means to be learning that, which shall never be completely known. This means trying to know the unknowable. Comprehend the incomprehensible. Explore the unexplorable. Define the indefinable. We will never know it completely. Though we learn some today, there will yet be more to learn tomorrow. And even in a world without end, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we will not yet know the height, depth, length, breath, and the love of God. Love will outlast the sun. Love will outlast the moon. Love will outlast the stars. For as long as God lives, love will live. For God is love. To know the love of God which passeth understanding. Booth Cliburn put it like this. Down from his glory, ever living story, my God and Savior came and Jesus was his name. Born in a manger to his own a stranger, a man of sorrows, fears, tears, and agony. What condescension bringing us redemption that in the dead of night not one faint hope was in sight but God gracious tender laid aside his splendor stooping to woo to win and to save my soul but on an asylum wall an inmate wrote could we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies a parchment made to write the love of God above and every man a star and every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe betrayed to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry nor could the scroll contain the whole though stretched from sky to sky oh 
whole love of God, how rich, how pure, how measureless, how strong, it shall forevermore, forevermore, forevermore endure. It's the saints and the angels' song. How much did he love me? I really don't know, but enough to lay aside his robes of splendor for a borrowed peasant's gown. Enough to trade a gilded throne to be hanged on an old rugged cross. Enough to trade a royal diadem for a crown of thorns. Enough to trade a scepter for a walking stick. Enough to quit living with the holy angels crying, Holy, holy, holy day and night for a jeering mob screaming, Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. He gave up heavenly manna to come and be unhungered. He left the river of life to come and cry, I thirst. He gave up a heavenly host to come and be alone in Gethsemane and pray until his sweat became great drops of blood. For our sakes, he gave up riches that we could be made rich. He became poor that in his poverty we might be made rich. He came to where we were to bring us to where he is. He gave up no rest. He gave up rest for no place to lay his head. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. But he just kept on loving us still. He loved until he gave all. I don't know how much he loves me, but enough to be despised and rejected of men and we esteemed him not. Enough to be stricken and smitten and afflicted of God. Enough to be wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, chastised for our peace and whipped for my healing. He loved me enough to pour out his soul even unto death. He loved me to be numbered with the transgressors. He loved us all to bear the sins of all. And he made, mech, he made intercession for all transgressors. He enough that in the days of his flesh, he prayed all night, many nights, and a great while before every day. He prayed when he was hungry. He prayed when he was tired. He prayed when he was lonely. He prayed when he was popular. He prayed when he was unpopular. He prayed when dying. He prayed for the Pharisees. He prayed for the Sadducees. He prayed for all sinners. He prayed for all men. He prayed always. And now he ever liveth to pray and make intercession for every one of us. I don't know how much he loves me, but enough to cry, forgive them, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Enough to go to Joseph's tomb for three days and nights. Enough to look Simon Peter up after the resurrection and who had cursed him and who had denied him. We'll never know how much it passes finding out. It's better defined by actions than by adverbs anyway. We shall never know its beginning. We'll never know how much. We shall never know its cost. But thank God we shall never know its end. I, it cannot be extinguished. God's love is unending, undiminished, forever, eternal. It's stronger than death. Death can't destroy it. Death can't kill it. Kill it. it can't be killed. It's a book you'll never complete. It's a search you'll never end. You'll never drink it dry. You, it'll never run dry. It'll always be there. Use it today. More will be there tomorrow. It's broader than the ocean. It's deeper than the sea. It's longer than time. It's deeper than hell. It will last eternally. It can never be fully known. It passes knowledge. It costs all. Has no beginning. Has no ending. Love has no beginning. Love has no ending. You may be seated. And to think. And to think. Please think. That love has been manifested toward you and me. The love of God, which was in Christ Jesus the Lord, has been manifested toward you and me. It has been bestowed upon you and me without reservation. No wonder the apostle John, the beloved John who moved in a circle of love cried out, behold what kind of love is this? What manner of love that he hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. I don't know when it began and it will never end. I don't know how much he loved me. I don't know the cost. I can't know why but he loves us and I thank God he did. I 
I know I'm a little late in telling you my subject for because of the times 19 and 8 9. But I wanted the Holy Ghost to burn it into our hearts. Burn this into our hearts. Burn this burn this subject loving the way Jesus loved loving the way Jesus loved no beginning no ending forever death can't kill it it will last eternally loving the way Jesus loved is the only way we're gonna make a difference in our world loved is the only way you're going to make a difference in your city, in your church, in your ministry, in your life, in your world. The only way we will make a difference in this hurting, bruised, bleeding, broken, diseased, lonely, confused, prodigal world is loving the way Jesus loved. And love so amazing, so, de so divine demands my all, my soul, my life. Say my all. That's why he was so very, very careful to define the kind of love he was calling his disciples and would-be disciples to. Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another just like I have loved you. And by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another as I have loved you. And a little later he continues the same theme and emphasizes that this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. For no greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you, and you continue in my love. It flowed through me as I have loved you. It flowed through me. Now you continue in that. It flowed through me. Now it must flow through you to all men everywhere. John said, Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God for God is love. Herein is love not that we loved God but that he loved us. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him are you hearing me? We love him because he first loved us. And to this all of the apostles agree. Simon Peter, the man with the key, said, See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Let love be without dissimulation. Let love be with it without disguise. Let love be without hypocrisy. Let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but let us love in deed and in truth. For whosoever hath this world's goods and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion, how saith the love of God dwelleth in him? Woe be unto us, Pentecostals, if it's only in tongue or in word and not in deed. For there are those for whom nothing has been prepared and we owe the love of God to them. Paul said, John said unto him who purchased us, who, who purchased us with his own blood. Jesus said, just as I've loved you, you love. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those that curse you. For if you love only those that love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. Love as I have loved. The only way you'll make a difference in this world is to love just like Jesus loved. I cry out today, shape us, make us, transform us, transfigure us into the image, into the image, into the image, into the likeness of God Almighty, even our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, for loving the way Jesus loved is the only way we're going to make a difference in our world. In a trilogy of stories about lostness, Jesus gives three parables. Jesus. First, there is the lost sheep. Lost because of curiosity. Seeing a gap in the hedge, it had wandered from the flock. We know what the shepherd did. He left the ninety and nine, went on the rocky steep all night through the heat and the cold until he found that one lost sheep, bound him with cords of love, and brought him safely back to the fold. Then there is the lost coin. 
due to loss, due to carelessness or by accident. It was either intentionally mishandled or unconsciously dropped. But a woman turned her house upside down and swept in every nook and corner until she found that lost coin. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. But here it is. There is a lost son. Lost willfully. Lost rebelliously. Lost because of his own choices. Lost without anyone to blame for his condition but himself. But there's more here than lostness. There is a father in this third parable who sadly gave his son his inheritance, watched him move away, but gladly welcomes his penniless son home again, runs to meet him, falls on his motley neck, kisses him, orders the fatted calf to be killed, bring the best robe, bring the ring. This is my prodigal boy, lost because of his own willful, stubborn, rebellious way. And he said that reveals the heart of God who so loved that he gave all. love of God how rich how pure how measureless how strong it shall forevermore endure he even told the pouting brother listen who stubbornly refused to take part in the welcome party for his younger brother son thou art ever with me and all that I have is thine and I don't care if they're a prodigal. I don't care if they're an elder brother. God's love is extended to you and all that he has is yours and everybody else's. <laughs> Loving the way Jesus loved is the only way we're going to reach our world. Because love is something God does. He doesn't just say it, he does it. See him yonder reaching for the outcast, the friendless, the homeless, the hungry, the naked, the poor, the shackled, the imprisoned, the hurting, the suffering, the brokenhearted, the abandoned, the maimed, the lame, the blind. See him weeping over that ill-fated city of Jerusalem. See him weeping as he stands by Lazarus' grave. See him move with compassion as he looks at the hungry multitude. Then dying on a cross between two thieves, lifted his eyes toward heaven and prayed for his tormentors. Father... Forgive them, for they know not what they do. But a hostile Roman soldier who had assisted in the crucifixion was overcome and changed when he heard the words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Oh, that's what love can do. That's what love can do. Loving the way Jesus loved is the only way to make a difference in our world. As I have loved you, you love. For I have given you an example that you should do as I've done unto you. You be imitators of me. You follow me and I will make you fishers of men. That's why in the first letter to the Corinthians, Paul discussed spiritual gifts. In chapters 12 and 14, these gifts are defined, described, and illustrated. We're reminded that God has given some the ability to speak with tongues of men and of angels. The ability to speak with great oratorical ability. To some, God gave the ability of great faith so that they could move mountains and perform miracles. To others, has been given the gift of suffering to give of their bodies to be burned that they might example to others as they suffer for the cause of Christ. Or to offer themselves on the altar of service to Jesus Christ. Then... God gave his different gifts to different people. To some he gave the gift of government. To others the gift of healing. To some the gift of miracles and diversities of tongues. To others the gift of wisdom and the gift of knowledge. And the gifts of helps. And then he concludes the chapter by saying, But covet earnestly the best gifts, but I'm going to show you a more excellent way. You might as well shout. Because you're not going to shout in a few minutes. And I humbly say that. These next 13 verses of 89 words will reveal the more excellent way. For though I speak with tongues of men and of angels, and I have not charity, God love, Christ love, uh, agape love, I am become as a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not the love of God, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not divine love, I am nothing. Might as well shout, folks. If it's getting through, you might as well shout. 
We're nothing. We're sounding brass and tinkling cymbal until we get the love of God as he loved. The word for charity here is agape in English, agape in Greek, but to me it's just God love, divine love. It's used eight times in these ten sentences, and I say unto you, if love is that important to life and eternity, it is important that you and I live trying to learn more about love and trying to get it. It is not filial. It is not eros. It is not even coming to man. It has no counterpart in human experiences. It has no comparison. The love of God, agape love, divine love, is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. It requires continuing dependence upon the Holy Ghost for he who has the gift of tongues is supposed to have the gift of love. And he who has the gift of faith is supposed to have the gift of love. For faith worketh by love. Faith worketh by love. Faith worketh by love. For they are the gifts of the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is love. And when you receive the Holy Ghost, you receive agape. You receive divine love. And God wants all His people to have the gift of love. For the fruit of the Spirit is love. And by your fruit, love not gifts, shall all men know that you're my disciples. And that's why Paul says, if we speak with tongues of men and of angels, but do not have that kind of love, we're sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Tongues, no matter how exotic or complex, without love or nothing. They're nothing more than noise without meaning. For if I were able to master all of the 4,000 languages or dialects of earth, or if I could supernaturally communicate in the 900 dialects of Asia, the 600 dialects of Europe, the 300 dialects of Africa, or the 1100 dialects of the Americans, or if I could speak and pray in the languages of heaven and didn't have love, I am nothing, I am nothing, I am nothing. It would all be simply noise without meaning and it would profit me nothing. Just a sounding brass or a clanging symbol and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not God love I am nothing prophecy which is considered to be the greatest of all of the spiritual gifts is worthy worthless of no lasting value without the love of God <laughs> though I have the rare gem of knowledge to be able to answer all of the unanswerables in scripture Although I have sufficient faith to move mountains or move hills from their places, without love it would only startle the witnesses and change earth's ge geography. For if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not the love of God, it profiteth me nothing. Even if I hold up a lettered placard which reads, I love Jesus, and then pour gasoline over my body and ignite it so that I am burned to death, it is nothing but a waste of fuel, a waste of a life, and a waste of time. If I don't have divine love, it won't profit me nothing. I am nothing. I'm a sounding brass and a clanging cymbal. And in just 89 words, Paul lays down an indictment on us all. A love that divides and criticizes is not agape love. A love that seeks its own revenge is not divine love. A love that refuses to, to initiate reconciliation between others is not God love. A love that says it won't forgive is not agape love. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. I cannot fulfill the law, royal law without it. If I offend in one point, I'm guilty of it all. And love is the only way to fulfill it. For he that saith do not commit adultery said also thou shalt not kill. And if I do not have agape love, I am nothing. For God love is patient, suffers long, refuses to retaliate. God love is kind. Kindness rejects cruelty and seeks constructive ways to improve another person's life. You are, you are something, you are something that God made in his image and down in every human heart that has been crushed by the tempter. There are feelings lying buried that grace can restore, touched by a loving heart, wakened by kindness. Chords that were broken can vibrate once more. For love is not jealous. Jealousy is as cruel as the grave. Love does not boast. 
Love does not vaunt itself, does not seek to impress, does not parade itself, does not seek personal gain. Love is courteous, does not act unbecomingly, indecently, irresponsible, never perverts its way, never acts out of character. It is not crude, rude, or lewd, always acts in the best interest of others. Love is unselfish. Divine love costs something. Does not pursue selfish advantages. Shares with others. Does not seek its own. Does not use others to get where it wants to go. Love is not provoked. Love is not irritable or touchy. Never loses control of itself. Never responds in anger. Never lashes out while being reviled. Love reviled not while suffering. Love uttered no threats. Love forgives. Love, when wronged, has a short memory. It forgets what it forgives. It doesn't keep a record of a wrong suffered. But love delights in truth, hath pleasure, hath no pleasure in wickedness, contends for the faith that was once delivered, loves righteousness, hates sin. I'm talking about the kind of love that drove the money changers from the temple with a whip of cords. I'm talking about the kind of love that when the religious leaders withstood Jesus for healing the withered hand of a man on the Sabbath, he looked round about them and with anger. I'm talking about the kind of love that hates every false way and refuses to bid God's speed to those who hate the truth. I'm talking about a love that has substance, a love that has strength. I'm talking about a love that's a savour of life unto life or death unto death. I'm talking about a love that has power and strength and a love for truth and a love for righteousness. There are two sides to the coin of love. Love is all sufficient. It bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. Agape love is all I need. It'll carry me out of the past, in the present, and into the future. It can take us from the cradle to the grave and all the way yonder and even beyond. It will help us survive the rat race. It will enable us to live on the ragged edge without falling off. It will even make it possible to exist in a colorless, drab, uneventful life without giving up. Love never gives up. Love never gives up. Love never gives up. It bears. It believes. It hopes. It endures. It is sufficient for every moment of life. The past, the present, the future. Love never goes out of style. Love is never surpassed. Love is never replaced. Prophecy, tongues, faith, hope shall cease. Love is permanent. It thrives at all times and in all places. Love is the only grace that we will carry with us into eternity. It is superior to faith and hope. Love is the greatest. Love is the greatest. Love never fails. Love abideth not alone. Love will never be taken out of the game. Love will never be booed off of the stage. Love will never get the gong. Love will keep on keeping on after everything else has ceased. That's why Paul said covet gifts but pursue love. It's the only thing in life worth the effort. It's the only thing in life that is eternal. Without it, everything else is tactless and repulsive. Our service is pointless and wasted. Life has no meaning without love. Ministry has no enduring quality without love. I tell you, love is the greatest. Love surpasses all. And a rediscovery of that kind of love is the only way we're going to make a difference in our world. That kind of love must be reciprocated. That kind of love will love God with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And will love its neighbor as itself. Thus you will fulfill the whole Bible. That kind of love will love truth uncompromisingly, even unto death. That kind of love will start a revival the devil nor hell can't stop. That kind of love will build a church in any city, anywhere, anytime. That kind of love will pray all night and at the dawn of every day. That kind of love will intercede, supplicate. It will repossess what was declared should be before the foundation of the world. It will lay hold of God's sovereign will and it will take care of every devastated area. It will stand in the gap and it will make up the hedge. It will fast not only food, but it will live a fasted life as is revealed to us in Isaiah chapter 58. It will bind up the brokenhearted. It will unlock prison doors. It will set the captives free. It will hurt when others hurt. It will suffer when others suffer. It will weep with those that weep. It will rejoice with those that rejoice. God's love 
will love the loving and the unloving, the lovable and the unlovable, the lovely and the unlovely. Love its enemies, loves friends, loves when the victor's crown is gleaming, loves when defeat, defeat has spread her gloom, loves when shame has come our way and when no friend comes into view. Love, 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 love never gives up. Paul said the love of Christ the love of Christ constraineth me. I was stoned and left for dead, but I couldn't lie there. I had to get up and preach on. I was constrained. I gloried in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress. I was beaten with 195 stripes. I was shipwrecked. I was weary. I was in pain. I was hungry. I was thirsty. I was in fastings often. I was cold. I was naked. And the care of all the churches were upon me daily. But love constrained me. Love drove me. Love sent me from continent to continent from city to city love drove me love 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 unfeigned never gives up jesus said to the church at ephesus you love truth you hate every false way you hate false doctrine you hate false prophets your labors and your patience is unsurpassed but you have left your first love you better remember your revival in acts the 19th chapter you have fallen from that revival for in that revival so mightily grew the word of God that pornography was wiped out. Demons were cast out. Handkerchiefs from Paul's body was taken to people and diseases departed. You better go back and do your first works over. You better repent. Everybody cry that. Repent or what? Else. Say it louder than that. Repent or else I will come unto you. Say it again. And I will remove the candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. Read Acts the 19th chapter, Ephesus, and go back and do it all over again. And we better not lose or leave our first love. For to lose your first love for God and souls can become deadly. It can negate everything else you ever try to do. Repent! 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 For history holds no record of any genuine lasting revival without repentance from God's people. Repent, repent, repent for loving the way Jesus loved is the only way we're going to make a difference in our world. And today the love of many has waxed cold. Serving Jesus has become a routine. Business as usual, saying the right things and performing the right deeds. It has become hard work to study the Word, next to impossible to pray and fast. Going to church is matter of factly, with no enthusiasm or joy. The anointing, the fire has been replaced for a form of godliness. No love for souls, no organized effort for reaching them, no power of God. Oh, the only way we're going to make a difference is loving the way Jesus loved. Don't you know the unbelievers in the fast lane headed for hell? He can only be rescued by the power of God. Not only must we intercede, we must get something from God every day and reach people every day. We must reach out to them with love and mercy with the truth which will set them free and the truth shall set them free and only the truth. And we must pray intercedingly until the bands are broken and we bring every lost sheep and we rescue every prodigal and we find every lost coin. For let us face the grim startling fact that we are becoming used to the thud of lost souls as they tramp the road to hell. We don't believe in a literal burning lake of fire. You mamas and daddies and preachers and Sunday school teachers can't believe in it like we say. No, we don't believe it. And until we love the way Jesus loved. That's our greatest need, folks. I've tried not to slow down. But we've gotten so used to the status quo. In my words and yours could be the mess we're in. We've just gotten used to it. We've gotten used to having church with no revival with no souls, nobody ever being baptized, just used to it, draw my check, get my money, go my way, have a good time, take more R&Rs than I do anything else, lost, lost, we've lost the power to weep, we've lost the power to wrestle, to plead, and to agonize, oh lost souls, we're guilty, we're guilty, we're everyone guilty, we're everyone guilty. A thousand million souls are dying. 
with no conviction of their lost condition, simply because we lack deep convictions about eternal woe and a burning lake of fire. I want that to grip me today. I tell my husband, I tell my husband, I tell my son, I want to be a changed woman when I leave this pulpit today. I don't have what I'm talking about, but I'm going to pursue it with every ounce of strength that I've got. One life will soon be passed, and only what you do for Jesus Christ will last. Revival campaigns are coming and going. Cities, towns, and villages are just as lost as ever. We've become so professional and mechanical, cold in our efforts, we're not reaching for souls. No passion, no agony, no tears, no fervency, no bleeding, no burden, no real love. No holding on to God with a deathless, despairing grip. If men go to hell, who cares? It is impossible to win souls with cold hearts and dry eyes. There's got to be a deep humility of soul with mourning and fasting, with intercessions and groanings that cannot be uttered. Then God will work and only then. And I ask you today, are you a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal? Are you just making a lot of noise? Repent. Repent. There needs to be old-fashioned repentance here today. If we don't love souls, how sayest the love of God dwelleth in us? If we shut up our bowels of compassion against any man when God loves indiscriminately, how sayest the love of God dwelleth in us? And I'm just a lady, but if I could say it as powerfully as our superintendent said it last night, until my glasses would fall off or until I fell prostrate on this, and everybody in here would fall on their faces and wouldn't care whether they ever got up till they got it. Somebody's got to get this. Somebody's got to get this. You can't pray mechanically. You can't go to church mechanically. You can't fast mechanically. If you don't love the way Jesus loved, you're just performing and we're sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. You're not? Somebody ought to cry out, repent. Somebody ought to cry out. During the great Welch revival, Dr. F.B. Meyer saw Evan Roberts pray in such agony of soul, it seemed as though his very heart would break for the lost. A friend of Dr. Meyer's who stood near him said, this is too dreadful. I cannot bear to hear this man groan so. So I'm gonna start a tune or something to drown it out. Dr. Meyer said, whatever you do, please don't do that. Because what this man's got, I've got to get. I want to get it until it sinks deep into my soul. Because I've preached the gospel to great masses of people. But I've done it with dry eyes. I've done it with a heart that was cold toward them. I did it only to perform and for people to say you preached a great message. He said, they remained untouched, they remained unmoved, they remained unturned, and I never had revival. Dr. Meyer fell on his face and cried out, My God! My God! Let this man's agony touch my own soul! My God! Let me pray like this boy prays! My God! Let my heart break like this boy's heart breaks for he loves souls and I loved only preaching he loves praying and I loved only praise and let me learn that heartbreaking sob of love for souls and I tell my husband and my son and our church family I want that and I don't want you to recognize me from this moment on I have never seen a compulsion on any of our part of falling on our faces and forgetting everything else and losing all pride and self-image and falling before God and coming back that we could change our world and turn it upside down and reach for every prodigal without stretched arms. Loving the way Jesus loved is the only way we're going to make a difference in our world. Wrestling in prayer is something more than breathing a two-minute prayer before hopping into bed or stepping into your car in the morning. 
Agonized wrestling means to get down before God and stay down before Him until you get hold of the horns of the altar and you prevail. This kind of wrestling involves pleading, begging, agony and sweat, persevering, persistent seeking, asking, knocking until something happens. Love never gives up and it abides not alone. I want to repent here today of all I've ever said or done to anybody or about anybody. I want to repent of not loving souls like I ought to love souls. I want to repent of not praying until it has happened. I want to repent of not living a fasted life. I want to repent of not reaching, reaching, loving, saving, helping, reaching, reaching, reaching. For until I love the way Jesus loved, I want to keep on reaching until I get that kind of love and then we'll change our world. What about it, preachers? What about it, preachers? Are there any preachers here? Where are you? What about it? What about it? I can't hear you. What about it, preachers? What about it, Sunday school teachers? What about it, workers? What about it, helpers? What about it, mama? What about it, daddy? What about it? What about your children? What about your church? What about your city? What about your class? Unless someone intercedes, there are those who will never be saved. Unless someone intercedes, there are those who will never be saved. Unless somebody repents, unless somebody forgives the $20 instead of the 20,000 that was forgiven you until somebody repents and until somebody forgives and until somebody holds on to God and stands in the gap there are those who will never be saved there are those who will never be healed there are those we need people who are willing to be intercessors this kind of praying motivated by Christ's love is the key to the great revival of these last days all of the great moves and manifestations of the Spirit of God must be born in the spirit of groanings and travail. We must bring them forth from the bowels of our being as is said of the true mother in 1 Kings chapter 3 for her bowels yearned upon her son. The church must begin to give birth now when Zion travails from her innermost being it will happen. George Whitfield cried, give me souls or take my soul. David Brainerd said, I care not where I go or how I live or what I endure. Just let me save souls. When I sleep, I dream of them. When I awake, they are first in my thoughts. No amount of scholastic attainment of able or profound exposition of brilliant and stirring eloquence can atone for the absence of a deep, impassioned, sympathetic, love of human souls the seraphic John Fletcher said love continual universal ardent fervent love is the soul of all labors of a minister that it in a nutshell that's it in a nutshell are you a sounding blast or a clanging gong one of our pioneer ministers before the days of automobiles said that he quit his work in the middle of the afternoon. He hitched up his horse. He drove 20 miles to pray with a man whom he felt was drifting far from God. He said, I just couldn't help it. My love and my concern for him was so great. I couldn't rest until I'd done my best to bring him back to God. I didn't want him to be lost. Love constrained me. This is the thing that the rank and file of the church and and the preachers and the rods must recover for loving the way Jesus loved is the only way we're going to make a difference in our world. For the sake of the tape, I continue. The evening sun was setting on the Judean hills and there was an auction block where the auctioneer was auctioning slaves to the highest bidder. A prophet of God whose voice was raspy for the preaching of the years, whose shoulders were drooped because of the burdens of the people he had carried, and in whose heart, and whose heart had been broken because many years ago his wife had fallen into sin and become a prostitute. 
the prophet of God was standing, an old man now. He was standing there in the auctioneer's presence, just watching the slaves as they were sold. The prophet of God had had a rough life. The three children born to him and his wife were now grown, and they too had gone into harlotry and prostitution. It's been a rough life for the old prophet. But the old prophet of God listens to the auctioneer receiving the bids for slave after slave after slave. Suddenly an old lady comes up for auctioning. Her years are mostly gone. Nothing much left to give. And to his complete surprise, the old preacher recognizes her to be his wife of his youth. Gomer was her name. The old preacher begins to bid and he continues to bid and bid and bid and bid until he outbids every other bidder and he purchases Gomer because he loves Gomer and he will never give up for Gomer he's going to get Gomer back I'm going to bid and bid and bid until I get Gomer back she may not have nothing to give but I love Gomer oh that's human love but it costs more than that to love like Jesus loved and the only way we're going to make a difference in our world is loving the way Jesus loved did you give me food when I was hungry? Did you give me to drink when I was thirsty? Did you give me clothes when mine were rags? Did you come to see me when I was sick or in prison or in trouble? Did you pray for me, intercede for me when you saw me wandering far from God? Or did you let me go my way? For when you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. I am disguised under every type of humanity that treads the face of this earth and all souls are mine. Every living soul is mine. Every living soul is mine. Love them all. Love them as I have loved you. For though you speak with tongues of men and of angels and you have not Christ's love, you are sounding brass. You are clanging cymbal. You are nothing. Repent. Repent. Repent, lest I come quickly to remove the candlestick out of its place. A thousand million souls are dying. A thousand million souls for whom the Savior died. Will you still deny their plea? Will you longer idle be while a thousand million souls are dying for loving the way Jesus loved? Loving the way Jesus loved is the only way we're going to make a difference in our world everybody would you fall on your faces where you are everybody everybody surely you want that love that love that will not give up that love that will reach that love that will change the atmosphere of your church that love that love that will change the atmosphere of your church that love that love that faith worketh by that love that can only reach our world. Faith works by love. Gifts work by love. Love of God, how rich, how pure. Love of God, oh, love of God. Oh, love of God. Oh, love of God. Oh, love of God. Oh,